So we're at the WORK Economic Summit and I'm with Mr. Spencer Dale. Thank you so much for that really insightful talk. Um, so to start off with, how does it feel to be back at Warwick like after all those years? It feels very cool. I mean, I, wor I wish it wasn't quite as many years as it is, but it's 27, 28 years. I had a fantastic time here. Um, I feel very um, sort of privileged to have done it. And I still have many friends um, from that course, which I did here. And then coming back today, was, I mean, it's not the first time I come back, but it's fantastic. We have a room full of 500 odd students here for the weekend keen and enthusiastic to learn about economics, a fantastic set of speakers. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. Mm, sounds great. Um, so uh, for those who couldn't be here, can you please summarise your talk? So I, yeah, so I asked three questions about the future of energy. So one was, much of the way we think about oil is a world where we think eventually we'll run out of oil. Much of the textbook economics is based around that. I think it's increasingly likely that we'll never run out of oil. So you have to then tear up those textbook models. What do we put in place? That's question number one. Question number two was, the world up till now, when we think about gas markets, had been had largely had segmented markets. The US, Europe, and Asia all had separate markets. And the reason why they were segmented, because most gas was traded via pipelines. And you can't pick pipelines up and put them in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. That's about to break down with the, the advent of something called liquefied natural gas, which is a gas which you can put in barrels and ship around the world. And I was trying to explore what a globally integrated gas market may look like and how it may evolve. And the third question was, renewables are growing, renewable energy, wind and solar energy is growing enormously quickly. How quickly will that penetrate the energy system? How quickly will the energy system evolve? And uh, what we did in that one was say, well, what does history tell us about that? And what we can see from the past history of energy transitions, it takes an awful long time, many, many decades, for energy um, to, to really penetrate, new energies to penetrate the energy system. And so just trying to learn the lessons from history about what that implies for renewable energy. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Um, in that vein, you also mentioned that the demand for energy will really soar in Asia. So what do you think about the potential for renewable energy like in the developing world and the developed world? Do you think it'll be different? or? I think um, m most of those, so both China and India have very ambitious targets for energy. Um, the world, the, the sort of leader in the growth of renewable energy is China. Mm -hmm. We expect China to produce more renewable energy over the next 20 years than the EU and the US put together. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, um, China is enormously dependent on coal. We think their share of coal will decline from something like two-thirds today to a little below 45% or so over the next 20 years. But to do that, it will need to grow almost every other energy very aggressively. So part of that is renewable energy, mm -hmm. but also it will need to grow its use of gas very dramatically and its growth of nuclear energy very strongly. Mm -hmm. And so um, renewables will play a role, but they can only play a role if, we're allowed, if, if, if for, a for a country like China is so significantly reduce its dependency on coal. Right. Uh, what do you think about the infrastructure that comes along with using renewable energy? Do you think they'll be able to cope up with that infrastructure? Yeah, so uh, the big issue with renewable energy is what we say in, in the sort of the, the industry is the intermittency problem. And the intermittency problem is the fact that um, at the moment we can't store energy in, 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 as, as sort of a grid size level, enough to sort of power the whole energy system. And so solar energy is great when the wind and uh, when the sun is shining likewise wind energy when the wind is blowing but if i want to put my kettle on when i get home tonight and the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing how do i i won't can't rely on renewable energy and so there's this problem of intermittency in how you adjust the system and that's one of the big issues and that's why there's enormous amounts of investment going into trying to generate storage solutions if we can create storage solutions then we can capture that energy when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, and then we can use it for later. But until we get to that point, we need to find other problems, uh, other solutions to me putting my kettle on tonight. Mm -hmm. And that's one of, the, one of the significant issues associated with renewable energy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you mentioned um, in your interview, in an interview last year, you mentioned that you don't see electric cars as having a huge impact on the crude market. So um, in your opinion, what do you think would be the next game changer? Ah, so let's, so, um, so I think to, I, I, within cars, 
we, we see enormously strong growth in electric vehicles. There's about one million electric cars on the planet today. Mm -hmm. I think there'll be closer to 100 million electric cars um, in, in 20 years' time. But the nature of that is I think 100 million electric cars will reduce oil demand by something like one or one and a half million barrels a day. That's about 1% of the market. So it's just not big. Mm -hmm. Now, I may be wrong, and it may grow two or three times as quickly as that, 200, 300 million, but it's still only two or 3% of the market. Where you could get more exciting things is if you put those electric cars together with other aspects of the sort of what I call the mobility revolution. So self-driving cars, car sharing. So we, you and I don't own a car. We have Uber. Ride pooling. So not only do we use Uber, we use a cheap option where we actually find people who are all going into the same place and we share it together. You put all those things together, you can start having significant impacts. The other thing, um, which I think potentially could be a very significant, is the role of additive manufacturing or 3D printing. I was in um, the US Department of Energy last week, and in their showroom, they had this sports car that had been printed. A sports car that you can drive around, which would be fully printed. 3D printing is amazing. Um, and if we can print things rather than um, have to manufacture them, suddenly the whole nature of trade, the need for transporting different types of goods across the world, supply chains all start to, to fundamentally change. And so um, one of the things I know I'm going to be thinking a lot about over the next year, trying to think ahead of when we do our next um, energy outlook, is trying to understand the role of 3D printing and additive manufacturing. That's really interesting. Um, so uh, when we talk about uh, climate change, um, there's such a big debate about it. And while some are really optimistic that it's going, like, it's going to change for the better. There are other pessimists who believe that things are only going to get worse. So what do you think? Are you, do you share the optimism or the cynicism? Yeah, and the key point about climate is the world faces a really two really tough challenges. So as I was saying today in the talk, why does energy demand grow over the next 20 years? It's because something like 2 billion people are lifted out of low incomes into middle incomes, and as they do, they can start to enjoy the sorts of standard living that you and I enjoy. They have access to electricity, they can own a car. And as they do that, the demand for energy will rise. So demand for energy rising is a good news story. It's a corollary of increasing prosperity of people being lifted out of low incomes. Mm -hmm. So the world needs more energy, but it also needs carbon to fall. And how you solve those two problems is the sort of the big dilemma. If you only had to solve one of them, it'd be easy. Mm -hmm. um, and you, but if you do one and not the other, um, that's just not sustainable. We can't just worry about generating economic growth, ignoring carbon. But likewise, if, only, if we only ignore carbon, if we only focus on carbon and leave billions of people in poverty, that clearly isn't right either. Mm -hmm. And trying to solve both of these issues is really hard. Now, there are ways forward on this, and I think there are potential solutions to it um, um, in terms of changing technologies, changing behaviours, everybody take using energy far more efficiently. I think everybody needs to play a role here. Governments need to play a role in terms of providing the right incentives. Oil producers such as BP need to respond to that. But likewise, we all need to change our behaviours. I keep telling my children, turn the lights off every time you leave the room. My children, who will suffer far more from climate change than I will, and their children even more so, leave the lights on far more than I. And so we all need to start taking responsibility for solving climate change rather than allowing, waiting for governments or big oil companies to solve it. We all need to make a change. Um, that's really interesting because I was just going to ask you what you think about the trade-off between economic growth and sustainability, especially for developing countries who have a limited number of resources that they can only spend on one. Yes, um, I think it's absolutely right. So an example here in terms of a country, uh, we think the, gro the largest growth market for coal over the next 20 years is going to be India. And so if you say, well, I think the Indian growth will, will consume lots more coal, there are some people in the West will tut about that and say, well, this is very bad. Coal's a very um, carbon-intensive fuel. They shouldn't do that. But we think there's something like over a billion people on the planet today, um, nearly half of whom live in India, who don't have access to electricity. The vast majority of that increase in coal, coal consumption in India will go to the power sector to increase electricity generation to allow these people who are currently in fuel poverty have access to electricity mm -hmm. and so they're facing a trade-off in such a way which here in the West we don't um, face and so I mean I think the, mo the, so the 
the message I take from this, there's no simple moral high ground here. There's no simple message. There, is, there are trade-offs here, and different countries in different stages of development are, can, can deal with that trade-off in different ways. And it's very, we have to be very careful about making moral judgments about the behaviours of others without thinking deeply enough about where they are in the stage of their development and the, the, the challenges they face. So what do you think about the policies that can be introduced by governments to be able to like, stop climate change or reduce the harm? So I think effects? the big, and this is, there's some big economics here, is um, there's two sort of challenges. There's two broad ways in which you can do this. Yeah. One way is you do it by um, pricing carbon, by carbon pricing. You can do that by carbon taxation or you can do it by various sorts of trading schemes where you put a price on carbon. The other way is you do it via rules and regulations. Now, I, as an economist, much prefer the pricing me method. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is I have no idea the right way of achieving this. How much of this is buying electric cars? How much of this is by renewables? How much of this is using increasing energy efficiency? That's a very hard thing to know. If you put a price on carbon, that provides incentives for businesses, consumers, markets, producers to seek out the most efficient uh, path as technologies and behaviours develop. If you do it by rules and regulation, what essentially you're doing is asking governments to guess now what the path will be over the next 20 or 30 years and then implement that via a set of rules and regulations. It's enormously hard mm -hmm. for governments um, to pick winners and losers over a 20, 30, 30 year period. One of the basic lessons we know from economics is if we want to ration something, you price it. And I think that's the way we should think about carbon. If we want to get less carbon, put a price on it, and let the market then, and businesses and households and consumers find the most efficient way of rationing it. Right, I agree. Um, so just the last question, uh, what do you think of the summit so far? Uh, I think the summit's enormously um, exciting. I wasn't mm -hmm. aware of the summit until I was invited to it. It wasn't here when I was here mm -hmm. um, all that time ago. The idea of economists and stu people studying economics thinking about how economics is being used in the real world, I think is tremendously exciting. And I guess that's the key mm -hmm. message here. If you love economics as a student, you don't have to then study it for a while and then go off and do something else. You can carry on doing economics throughout your whole career, fascinating economic issues, and they even pay you for it. So it's mm -hmm. a very cool thing to do. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. Cool. And it was amazing to have you here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.